5 or 10 years, it's very possible that YouTube may no longer exist. With a few bad decisions, YouTube could soon become the new MySpace. And right now, it looks like TikTok would take its place, with TikTok developing a system for 10 minute plus videos in its attempt to destroy YouTube. But even today, with its short addictive videos, TikTok's growth is soon going to overtake YouTube's. YouTube was made 17 years ago and amassed over 2.1 billion active monthly users in this time. However, in just two years, TikTok has amassed over 1 billion active monthly users and it shows no signs of stopping, which is why some of the biggest YouTubers and creators are moving their content onto TikTok and hedging their bets against YouTube. And now investors are also following suit, with recent studies showing that Gen Z now engages with TikTok far more than YouTube. And while some like Mr. Beast are certain of YouTube's continued growth due to YouTube being pre-installed on every Android phone and YouTube's solid revenue model, this could all change very soon. In as soon as five years, YouTube could soon lose its monopoly on video content. So what caused YouTube's decline? And how did TikTok manage to take over the titan that is YouTube? Well, this was largely a result of a few key business decisions that slowly poisoned YouTube's creativity. And weirdly enough, this all started back with PayPal. The story of YouTube starts with PayPal. At the time, PayPal was revolutionary, changing banking and commerce dramatically. It was because of PayPal that everyone could buy and sell things securely without the hassle of bank transfers. It was a quick, simple process to send money. PayPal's changes to the online banking industry were unprecedented, but PayPal was seizing on just one tiny opportunity in the sea of the whole internet. And PayPal employees Chad Hurley, Steve Chen, and Jared Karam understood this. They needed to build their own internet project before it was too late. So their first idea was for a site called TuneIn Hookup, a video dating site where people could upload videos of themselves to find dates. But like most Silicon Valley stories, their first idea would be a flop, and TuneIn Hookup was abandoned. However, the PayPal employees weren't giving up this easy because they didn't have time. This was their one shot to take over the internet. They just needed to get the right idea. Where was their untapped demand? What do people want? What value could they provide? It was while they were discussing these thoughts that Jared would talk about Janet Jackson's Nipplegate, or in other words, the time when Janet Jackson unleashed her breast to the public for a microsecond. Jared would mention how hard it was to find any footage of the incident. It was almost impossible to go back and watch this historic moment. And it was on this day that they had struck gold. This was the answer they'd been looking for, a market need with untapped potential and no competition. So the PayPal employees used the infrastructure from the last business, Tune and Hook Up, to rebrand their project, eventually creating a site called YouTube on the 14th of February 2005. Once they had the idea in place, the guys would work day and night in the first YouTube office. And no, this wasn't a high up yuppie PayPal office like you'd expect. Instead, this was a rat infested room with pipe exposed ceilings above a pizza shop. And at night, they would sleep at friends' apartments, sacrificing their relationships, personal lives, time and money with the hopes of changing the world. And luckily for them, their sacrifices would soon pay off. YouTube's simple user interface and effective web design made the site a hit. The market loved it and YouTube quickly took over the internet. With its ease of use miles ahead of any other video sharing platform, YouTube started to grow exponentially. But there were still lots of problems to solve. The most pressing of these was the lack of funds. The founders even went into personal debt to pay for the increasing bandwidth YouTube servers used. But in the bigger picture, this didn't matter. YouTube's user base only continues to rocket, with weekly views doubling every week. However, the strategy for YouTube's success was stressful to say the least, because in this time, YouTube's entire success rested on the personal funds of its founders until it attracted enough investors. The plan being that once investors became interested in YouTube, the site's success would then be certain. Although, if investors didn't join in time, the whole site would crumble. It was an incredibly intense time to say the least, because YouTube's growth was so big that it was inevitable that investors would jump on board. Or would they? Because even with this impressive growth, YouTube still wasn't impressing investors. Why? Well, investors would often dismiss YouTube as cute and not a proper business. So this called for desperate measures, with the YouTube founders courting their former PayPal associates who ran venture capital firms. And with enough pressure, the founders finally received a vital $3.5 million. Their money problems were now solved. It finally looked like YouTube was going somewhere. The site would only continue to grow. And with the investments, YouTube could upgrade its service, developing the framework to embed YouTube videos into other websites which was a vital move back in 2005, because back then MySpace was the go-to social media. And on MySpace, users were quick to upload their favorite videos onto their pages. And by uploading their favorite videos onto their pages, this gained lots of viewers and publicity for YouTube. It was with all this growth and prosperity that now YouTube was starting to catch attention, but not always from the right places. As YouTube grew in popularity, more videos were uploaded every day, making it harder to prevent copyrighted material proliferating the platform. This culminated in a series of lawsuits and threats, with one of YouTube's first viral videos, Lazy Sunday, being taken down for infringement
infringing on copyright. This was a big vulnerability and could destroy the YouTube empire. So YouTube tried to make deals with the copyright holders like Universal and Viacom, but the mounting pressure from all sides kept growing as YouTube gained more steam. Every big company wanted to destroy YouTube. It was a threat to the entire entertainment industry. And a year later in 2006, these issues eventually proved insurmountable for the small company. The founders now had to make a big choice. Were they going to make YouTube one of the biggest websites in the world, or would they cash out? They'd already seen what large corporate interests could do to a company and its employees from their time at PayPal. However, the copyright problems were only getting worse. They were reaching the end stage of the Silicon Valley business formula. The formula where you create a site from the ground up, build sturdy foundations, a giant user base and include investors, but now they were reaching the final stage. The stage where they realized they can't make a profit or even handle the countless lawsuits aimed at them. They decided it was time to jump ship and begin the acquisition process. Now it's important I introduce a new character who will become very important later in this video. Her name is Suzanne Wojcicki. Suzanne Wojcicki had been one of Google's first employees back in 1999. Her focus back then in Google was in advertising and she was damn good at her job, where she would mastermind Google Ads and eventually AdSense, which became the lifeline of all online creators. But arguably the most impressive thing she's done was convince the Google founders to buy YouTube in 2006. Web giant Google will pay $1.6 billion to gobble up YouTube. Because by convincing the Google founders to do this, Google would end up making one of the best and most profitable business decisions since its founding. And the person behind it all was Suzanne Wojcicki. And so after Google acquired YouTube for a little over $1 billion, the YouTube founders were now multi-millionaires. But this was only the beginning for YouTube. But before we get onto that, I want to talk to you about CleanFox and digital pollution. CleanFox is a free web and mobile app that fights against digital pollution. Gathering more than 5 million active users, CleanFox detects and lists newsletters to allow its users to delete them and subscribe from unwanted ones in a few clicks. CleanFox does this by acting as the Tinder of newsletters, where you can swipe left to block the newsletter, or swipe right to keep the email, or then by swiping up to delete your emails. The CleanFox app is a real time saver for the average internet user who isn't obliged to click on each newsletter to unsubscribe manually, because on average a CleanFox user deletes 15,000 emails and blocks 30% of newsletters. And then by increasing your productivity, CleanFox also allows you to reduce your carbon footprint by tackling digital pollution. Which is really important because the internet's carbon footprint is growing by 9% each year. No other type of pollution is growing this fast. And if just 10,000 of my subscribers deleted 1,000 emails each, this would avoid the emission of 100 tons of CO2 per year, which is equivalent to 26 London to Los Angeles round trips by plane. This is because one email generates about 10 grams of CO2 per year, consuming as much energy as a 7 watt bulb lit for 3 hours. All of this pollution, even though 80% of emails are never opened in the UK. The unread emails of UK internet users emit an average of 2 million tons of CO2, which is as much as 1.3 million cars. And the problem here comes from not sending emails, but the storage of emails. And yet 80% of British people don't know that email storage causes pollution, and 70% have never heard of digital pollution. So to help tackle digital pollution and increase your productivity, download CleanFox on iOS or Android today by clicking the link in the description below. Now back to the video. At first, the deal worked perfectly for YouTube. Google would use its power to protect YouTube from copyright issues and handle all of the dirty work, while the founder Chad would continue his role as CEO and grow the company with the original vision. This mix of Google's money and power combined with Chad's vision brought a golden age to the internet, a place where YouTubers could take back power from the corporate media, gaining viewerships that rivaled CNN, Fox, Disney, and the best part was that anyone could do it. You can make a video about everything and anything and gain giant viewerships which granted YouTubers immense creative freedom, whilst also giving fans the content they wanted to see. Today with YouTube, that everyday people actually are the media. You guys don't just watch news, you make news. This was the core of YouTube, a place where anyone anywhere could express their opinions, creativity and personality to the world and be rewarded for doing so. Memes, rock rolls, cartoons, parodies, independent news, everything. In fact, without any of this, YouTube would have failed. Because what made YouTube stand out from every other site was the virality and creativity. Viral videos were the main factor for YouTube's original growth, with videos like the evolution of dance, Charlie bit my finger, David after the dentist, and more. And with these viral videos getting enormous view counts and worldwide fame, other creators would take notice and flock to the platform and compete for views. Which is why YouTube's slogan was always broadcast yourself. And so with everyone jumping on YouTube for a piece of the pie, 
YouTube then realized that without them, the site would be nothing. These independent creators were the lifeblood of YouTube. So in December 2007, YouTube launched the Partner Program, which allowed channels that meet certain metrics to run ads on their videos and earn money doing so, thus creating the modern YouTube we see today. Because by incentivizing creators with money, this in turn led to more competition. And it was YouTubers' constant competition for views, you know, doing everything they can for likes, subscribers, and engagement, that gave YouTube far more value than TV could possibly imagine. In fact, this made YouTube so popular that by just 2007 alone, YouTube consumed as much bandwidth as the entire higher internet in 2000. It was reported that by May 2010, YouTube was serving over 2 billion videos every day, which was almost double the primetime audience of all three major US television networks combined. According to figures from market research firm Comscore, YouTube was the most popular online video source in the United States in May 2010, with a market share of around 43% and over 14 billion videos seen. It was clear that YouTube was unstoppable, entertaining users endlessly each and every day. YouTube's growth generated a whole new wave of creativity and birthed a revolutionary period in internet history. This was the internet golden age. Incentivizing the best, most creative entertainers to create engaging videos you couldn't find anywhere else. YouTube was undoubtedly the greatest website ever created. It was sending shockwaves around the world. Everything was perfect. Or so it seemed. Because YouTube still wasn't actually profitable. Although by now it had attained a massive user base, companies still didn't see the value in running their ads on YouTube. And if YouTube couldn't find money fast, creators wouldn't be able to get paid, and so they would eventually leave the platform. If this issue continued, it would be the end of YouTube. So Google needed someone who could turn YouTube into what the advertisers wanted, whatever the cost for the average user or content creator. And of course, with Suzanne Wojcicki's past performance, she was the perfect person for the job. I mean, she was the person behind Google and YouTube's relationship in the first place. It's very likely that without Susan, Google would never have bought YouTube. I mentioned earlier that she worked on advertising for Google and most importantly created AdSense. With AdSense being the money behind the partner program which gives YouTubers a fair cut of the company's ad revenue. Without AdSense, none of your favorite YouTubers would even exist. YouTube wouldn't even exist. It was actually because of AdSense that big new media companies like Vice, Fox, Buzzfeed would begin to pop up out of nowhere. And more importantly, it motivated talented people around the world to pursue their creativity and passion for the potential of making bank, which had been evidenced by the huge flow of creators joining YouTube in the hopes of monetizing their dreams. By 2013, YouTube had over 1 million members in the YouTube Partner Program, 30 times that of the previous year. But YouTube couldn't keep this up. With the amount of creators joining the platform, YouTube had to find money fast. You see, one of the main reasons advertisers didn't want to advertise on YouTube was because of YouTube's bad advertising system. The system is called TrueView, and TrueView is what you see when you watch a YouTube video and there's an advertisement with a little skip button. TrueView tests and reports on all the analytics of the advertisement. It's how Google places advertisements on its services. But TrueView at the time was a very perplexing and untested system. It wasn't very precise and it wasn't good enough for advertisers. So Google had to make a major decision. And this decision whether to cave for advertisers or creators would have a significant significant impact on YouTube's future. Google obviously understood the importance of advertisers, so Susan was the perfect CEO. Because under Susan, TrueView got refined and YouTube rapidly expanded its ad revenue, with YouTube far exceeding the viewership of TV networks while also having the backing of big budget advertisers. Susan had seemingly solved the billion dollar question. She was now gaining YouTube tons of revenue and lots more viewership. And with more revenue, YouTube could reinvest it back into gaining more views. It was a genius business move. And on the surface, it seemed like like everything was fixed. But with every decision comes unforeseen consequences, and the results of this would only become more apparent in the years to come. So at this point, YouTube had worked out the perfect formula, gaining historic viewership while also being backed by the advertising industry. This gave YouTube big money to reinvest into making a better site, while also giving creators more incentive to upload higher quality videos. But like I mentioned before, everything and anything could be uploaded to YouTube. Spiteful bullying, commentary videos, eating hair cake, extremism, flat earth videos, anything. Because this was the core of YouTube, a place for anyone to broadcast themselves, which was great for everyone around the globe, apart from advertisers. Advertisers were having doubts about where the ads were being placed, and so advertisers began to pull out fast. Pepsi, BMW, Apple. And so in a desperate attempt to keep these advertisers on YouTube, YouTube would implement severe censorship rules, which led to stricter demonetization for creators. YouTube did this to ensure all its bases were covered and that advertisers would be happy. In fact, it got so extreme that YouTube's policy team, the people who determine what's acceptable and what's not, became completely unreachable for any creator or even YouTube staff to ensure the backlash would be minimal. This made 
made censorship mysterious. You had no idea if your YouTube video would be removed or not. It was up to this mysterious policy team. And so this forced creators to become squeaky clean, all in the hopes that YouTube's policy team wouldn't demonetize and censor everything they made. Which as you can imagine would take away all the fun channels. And then on February 2017, the Times of London reported that YouTube was supplying ads for videos from terrorist organizations and others that spouted hateful content. And while these claims may have been dubious, considering that the establishment media was completely threatened by YouTube, YouTube would still cave to the mob. Because in the next month, major advertisers like AT&T, Verizon and Pepsi all threatened to pull ads from YouTube after their ads were discovered to be running alongside content that was quote, promoting terrorism and anti them. So Suzanne Wojcicki would have to take some drastic measures, working with advertisers to specifically ensure that all their ads were placed on specific types of content and creators. And now this might sound reasonable, and it may have been the only option for Suzanne Wojcicki, but by doing this, this completely disconnected YouTube censors with YouTube creators and their audience, which slowly began to destroy everything that made YouTube. But back in this time, there was no real competition with YouTube. YouTube had the monopoly on video content, it was indestructible, and so they could kind of do whatever they wanted, and every creator would have to follow their orders. And so YouTube would go extremely hard on censoring and demonetizing videos. This period would later become known as the first adpocalypse, where nearly all creators would suffer the consequences having countless videos that were once monetized removed from the monetization program. In some cases, due to the new content policies, many videos would be taken down and the channels that uploaded them were issued community strikes. And once three community strikes were issued, that would be the end of hundreds of thousands of YouTube careers, all in the name of advertising. But what made this even worse is the major double standards YouTube would apply. Because if you were in the YouTube elite, you could completely disregard these rules and be promoted for doing so. Like that one famous Japanese incident with Logan Paul. The incident, which I can't talk about on YouTube. Logan would then upload this video to YouTube, where he would laugh about it throughout the entire video, receiving 6 million views before he decided to take it down. But the important part here is that Logan Paul took it down, not YouTube. Even though this video completely broke YouTube's policy guidelines, YouTube would actually put it on their hand-picked trending page, with the video being monetized and promoted, with YouTube refusing to even age-restrict the video. And there's so many examples of this that I could just go on forever, but you see it most clearly with music videos. Videos of rappers children, or Lil Nas twerking on Satan. All of these videos are monetized and actively promoted across YouTube. Not to mention all the other provocative content from Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, just to name a few. While at the same time, videos by Jordan Peterson defending himself against ridiculous, far-reaching claims of racism and white supremacy were consistently removed across YouTube. In fact, almost all political content was censored on the site, demonetized, striked, and censored into silence. Unless, of course, you weren't an independent creator. Because the only way to not be silenced or demonetized for political opinions is to have the right political opinions with the right corporate backing. If me or any other independent YouTuber were to speak about controversial news events, my channel would likely be striked, posing a serious risk for my channel being completely deleted. And I'm not exaggerating, because even videos like my tragic tale of Kanye West video got demonetized with a manual review for no reason at all. Or like when you do pass YouTube censors to discuss things like a quote, digital ID codes, you can soon become a massive target. This happened to me in December when I posted a video on the metaverse and digital ID codes. In seven days, the video had reached 1.9 million views, outranking all other videos on the same topic. But then after receiving criticism for my opinions, the YouTube algorithm switched off the tab completely. YouTube buried the video. You couldn't find it on any search results. It was completely blacklisted. And this happens to creators all the time on the platform. This isn't just me. People like Brett Weinstein have been struck multiple times for discussing such issues. However, if you're one of the late night jimmies, you have a free pass to talk about anything you wish. Or if you're the establishment media, you'll always be given preferential treatment, always being artificially pushed by YouTube. And this isn't just happening to political videos. It's happening to all creators across the platform. A few years ago, PewDiePie Pie was shadow banned from YouTube for no apparent reason. Filthy Frank's most viral videos all got removed from not abiding YouTube's content guidelines, even though at the time they followed all YouTube's guidelines. Leafy is his YouTube channel got terminated in 2020. Even Sky News Australia, a mainstream conservative news network, was banned for over a week following the airing of a presentation of quote, unconfirmed theories on the new virus. In fact, just a year ago, if you spoke about a certain lab, you would be entirely scrubbed from the site. Even the president Donald Trump was banned from YouTube. And even independent film creators like Rucka Rucka have all their videos demonetized. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. In fact, YouTube's inner workings are quite public to almost all YouTubers, with the content guidelines for YouTube changing at least once every three months since 2020, becoming stricter every single time. That's why content that might have been acceptable just a few years ago, now all of a sudden gets taken down or demonetized just because a new version of the algorithm changed a fraction. By doing this, it marks a dramatic change in YouTube 
YouTube's core foundation. YouTube's really no longer for anyone and everyone. In the words of Philip K. Dick, the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the words. By making these decisions, YouTube was going against the free speech utopia that YouTube was so destined to achieve. And by doing this, YouTube created a huge gap in the market, a gap that would soon be filled by a random lip syncing site called TikTok. Now it might seem premature to say that YouTube is going the way of MySpace, but all the factors that led to the downfall of MySpace are exactly the same forces working against YouTube today. Back in 2009, Facebook overtook MySpace and active users and controlled the market, completely destroying MySpace. A commonly given reason for this was that MySpace's huge dip in popularity came from corporate interests. And due to the site's outdated business model, in 2006, Google had pledged $900 million in an advertising deal with the social media giant. But with the mass introduction of adverts on MySpace, combined with an already poorly managed UI, and MySpace quickly became an ugly, old-fashioned site. This made Facebook the more viable option for users. However, the problem was about much more than just UI. The real main problem was that adverts got so bad on the site that it started to get in the way of the function of the site. MySpace was now focusing on the experience for advertisers and not on users. And there are scarily a lot of parallels between MySpace and YouTube. Another key factor for MySpace's downfall was that MySpace couldn't capture a younger audience. At the time of their rivalry, one of Facebook's main strengths was its ability to capture a younger audience than MySpace. And TikTok is exactly the same as this, with its audience skewing much younger than YouTube aging user base. And the problem with an aging audience is far more catastrophic than it first may seem. One of YouTube's main draws is its kingmaker ability for young content creators. Back in its golden age, the prevailing culture on YouTube was one of creativity, excitement, and virality. Anyone can make it big on the platform with just one viral video, which would then be the catalyst for a long and successful career on the site. But this isn't the case nowadays, with most new internet stars coming from TikTok or other sites rather than YouTube. YouTube sealed their own fate in this respect with their demonetization of new creators playing directly into TikTok's hands. All of these factors, just as they led to MySpace's demise and Facebook's rise, will lead to TikTok supplanting YouTube, and the process is already underway. It took YouTube 17 years of staying ahead of the curve to gain its 2.1 billion active monthly users. However, TikTok in just two years amassed over 1 billion active monthly users and it shows no signs of stopping. And at first it may seem that these sites aren't competing. After all, TikTok is famous for short videos which reward creativity and humor. You don't really get in-depth videos on TikTok. And seeing as its maximum video length is only three minutes, TikTok doesn't really seem to be competing with YouTube's traditionally longer form content. However, this is changing from both sides. YouTube's been putting more and more of their focus into YouTube Shorts, which is why you're now starting to see most of your favorite YouTubers use YouTube Shorts. Shorts, as this is a desperate attempt to crush TikTok's competition. However, TikTok, on the other hand, is now trying to extend their maximum video length to 10 minutes. These moves by both companies are putting the platforms in direct competition with each other because users usually stick to one platform. And with TikTok's much faster growth and younger audience, it seems like this battle can't be won. And TikTok's move into longer videos will create even more problems for YouTube. Since YouTube's always had a monopoly on music videos, if you're an artist and wanted your music video to get really any amount of attention online, it had to be on YouTube. Music videos are also one of the main draws to the site. None of the top 10 most viewed videos on the site are some sort of music video. YouTube has also based much of their monetization around music videos. Quote, 91% of YouTube music users have watched a related YouTube video beforehand. This all means that if TikTok starts to erode YouTube's dominance of the music video market, it could take away a large proportion of YouTube's user base as well as his income. This is yet another way that TikTok will gain ground on YouTube in the years to come. But the final and most important nail in the coffin is YouTube's corporatization that has pushed YouTube's creative edge into the ground. Right now, TikTok is taking away the very pillars that made YouTube so successful because TikTok makes it far easier for any user to go viral without any prior following. It provides anyone an audience with millions without shadow banning or censorship. Anyone can express their opinions on TikTok, unless it's about the Chinese government. This is why 13 TikTok accounts now reach 1 million followers a day compared to YouTube, where only five YouTubers reach 1 million a day. Because TikTok makes it far easier to become famous. All you need is a good song and use TikTok's own editing tools and you can become a viral hit. Whereas on YouTube, it takes months and years to gain anywhere near the traction of a simple TikTok video. And with TikTok's incredible user interface, insidious algorithm and short dopamine sucking videos, TikTok has become a far more addictive app. With the average TikTok user spending 52 minutes a day on the app, while the average YouTube user only spends 11 minutes and 24 seconds on the app. It seems very apparent that by YouTube's silencing of opinions, demonetization of creativity, and the promotion of corporatized media and advertisements on its platform, and YouTube is now driving away its creators and audience. 
Which is very sad because unlike most other social media sites, I truly believe that YouTube is good for society. I'm very grateful for the opportunity that YouTube has provided me personally, but overall, its actions are ruining the platform. And TikTok, I regard in much worse regards, is now taking over. And understandably so, because TikTok is a newer and more updated way to broadcast yourself. It is doing what YouTube's forgotten. And sadly, by this point, I'm not even sure if there's a solution for YouTube this time. Suzanne Wojcicki, while making YouTube the success it is today, may also be the main reason for its downfall.